Good evening, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here. I just said the day, as you said, going around the uh, facilities. And uh, I have to say, first off, how impressed I am by the university facilities here. They are incredible. And as an expedition and explorer, they haven't seen the back of me yet. I'm going to be back here before my next expedition. Also, today, a lot happened because uh, I met for the first time Team Force Atlantic. And I must admit, initially, I thought, we're not going to have a lot in common. I mean, you know, look at these guys. They've got roots, they're fit, they're muscly. Um, I'm double their age, possibly. <laughs> they're wearing a wardrobe which is professional and looking distinctly civilian. They're going to be talking to you about uh, roaming across the Atlantic in a specialist boat. I'm going to be talking to you about pulling a heavy sledge, not over an open ocean, but a frozen ocean. However, as it transfers, we have an awful lot in common because we're sharing very similar objectives. First of all, we both want to push out way beyond our normal boundaries. Not just in the geographical sense do we want to explore, but beyond those boundaries are unknown. <laughs> I think that it's one of the most exciting aspects of exploration because geographically, everybody these days knows where everything is. We've got satellite imagery, we've got David Attenborough. However, unless you're prepared to get up out of your armchair, you're not going to explore the extent of your own potential. Secondly, we both have a particular goal a dream, everybody does. But Team Force Atlantic and myself have a dream each that is going to push us beyond those boundaries that I was talking about. My dreams are crucial to any great achievements, but dreams remain just that, unless you've got the grit to leap over that dark crevasse of unknown and dare yourself to try it. Dream it, plan it, do it. Finally, Team Force Atlantic and myself share a great advantage. Some might beg to differ, but there were women. And by the way, for any men in the audience, I'm not a feminist, so you can relax. But what's so special about being a woman, particularly in the world of polar exploration? Well, when I started, the world of exploration was made up of men. I was trespassing in a bastion of male testosterone. This, to me, only added appeal to be a female polar explorer. I relished the opportunity, not so much to prove that we could do better than the men could, but rather to break new ground for women. Also, the physiological aspect intrigued me. Polar expeditions are an immense physical challenge. Could we as a woman power it using as much if not more of the mental strength rather than the physical brawn. And what would be the price tag on us as women? Hence the passion for measuring and finding out what the toll might take on a woman undertaking such a physical challenge. And that's why I do so much research with Tracy and her team. It didn't help in this bastion of male testimony that I didn't look the part of your preconceived image of a polar explorer. 
which is, as you can tell from this image here, tall, muscular, bearded or moustached. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm on the petite side, and I'm of a certain age. I'm not that muscly, and I certainly haven't got a beard yet. So, <laughs> as I didn't look the part of a polar explorer, you find it difficult too. <laughs> what did I think was going to empower a woman to take on and succeed in such extreme challenges? Well, it's something we all have men or women. And it's not about rippling biceps. It's about an inner, quieter strength. It's what's in your head and your heart. And that's where the real strength lies. Inside. And that's what keeps you going when it gets tough and the physical tank is empty. Ergo, it's also in the head where the devil lurks too. All too often in any challenge in life, the worst enemy is you. It's yourself. It's whether it's negativity, depression, aggression, and perhaps above all, fear. Which is why I've chosen this evening to focus on my North Pole solo expedition, as it was the most challenging expedition in every sense, but also my constant traveling companion was 24-7 fear. The Arctic was the most frightening of all my expeditions. Yes, here the Arctic looks benign, beautiful, postcard shot, and it does have a savage beauty to her. But I wasn't going to go on this bid to the North Pole solo for the ice scapes. I was doing it for the challenge of seeing if I was mentally and physically up to the mark. Few men have actually reached the North Pole solo. No women and several people, including women, have died in the attempt. So, why? What, what makes the North Pole so incomparably tougher and dangerous than, say, making a bit on the South Pole, on Antarctica? Well, for all the Attenborough programs about Antarctica and the Arctic, people still get muddled between North and South. So it really irks me when people get my expeditions muddled up between North and South. So a quick little geography lesson. Antarctica is a vast continent capped by a frozen cloche of ice, which contains over 70% of the world's fresh water. She's strewn with crevasses. In the words of Apsley Cherry Garrard, some of which are the size of St. Paul's Cathedral. Her surface is blasted by hurricane force winds, which exasperate temperatures of already minus 40s. Hauling a 120k sledge, as I did, a thousand kilometers over her surface to the South Pole is as much about mental endurance as it is 
physical. Long periods of freezing, miserable boredom and tedium interrupted by furious bursts of activity or sheer terror. How do you cope? Tedium is dangerous as it can make you lose concentration. You need an almost childlike imagination. Let yourself indulge in the theater of the mind to keep you distracted through those long, cold marching hours. But also on Antarctica, unlike the Arctic, the risks can be anticipated and therefore planned for. Prep well, or will be well, even if you bump into those crevasses, often camouflaged by snow drift. So get to know what is, get to know what is actually frightening you. Crevasses, training, went up to Norway, got into them, got to train and know how to try at least to get out of them. If you face up to your fears, then they don't seem so frightening anymore. You can banish them. But the Arctic is different and infinitely more of a challenge because you simply can't anticipate what's happening next. She is not a continent, but as you can see from this aerial shot, she is an ocean, the Arctic Ocean, covered with a crust of ice. This crust of ice is constantly shifting and disintegrating, and it's the planet's most frightening war zone of nature because the conspiring forces of the wind and the ocean currents are pushing all the time these great slabs of ice together and ripping them apart with terrific force. Close up, she's not flat because where those slabs of ice are being thrust together, they send up these huge great walls of rubble and ice called pressure ridges. These can be anything from 30 feet up into towering 50 feet high, and they can stretch for hundreds of miles. It's over these that the hapless Arctic explorer has to navigate round or over. And it's very rare as a result that on the Arctic Ocean you can actually navigate in a straight line. Here's another reason why not as well, because in between those pressure ridges where the slabs have been torn asunder, the ice opens up to the ocean itself three miles deep. The water is the most dangerous enemy to those who dare to cross up. One full step and you could plunge to your death in these icy depths. The Arctic is, as you can now imagine, a noisy, violent and dangerous place. Navigating your way to the North Pole demands nerves, agility, tactics, and resourcefulness. The famous explorer Robert Swan says, it's like playing chess with the devil. To survive, let alone succeed, demands thorough, research, preps, and ideally a little bit of experience, especially if you're going solo. Preps. 
I invested two years in my preps, and, and this looks a complete mess, and I'm a bit embarrassed to show it, but in fact, it's not at the early stage, it's, it's on the eve before departure, and it is the final unpack and repack, constant refining of kit. But it's important to show a picture like this because everyone tends to think that these expeditions begin with some sort of martini glamour of the first step onto the ice. But a lot of hard work, a lot of admin, a lot of logistics go into the preparations. I mean, two years is a long time. So it's like, it's like setting up and running a whole business. Even before you begin on the kit, you have to start with the research. Research that goal that you're aiming at. So yes, I went to all the creme de la creme of the Arctic explorers, particularly the Norwegians who always tend to get it right and spoke to them <coughs> and trained a bit with them. But I also spoke a lot to the people who hadn't perhaps realized their own polar dreams, the people who had made mistakes, because I found I was often learning an awful lot more from those people than those who had succeeded. Then, once you launch yourself into the complex mire of logistics, I found that everything had to either be made from scratch or certainly with serious modifications, because a lot of it was made for men. And also, times have changed. Global climate changes. There was a lot of different kit that one had to take. And if you look into this picture a little bit, you'll see that even the shape of my sledge I had designed so that it could float in water. And if anyone has time later, you'll see from some of the kit here, which I can talk you through, but there's even um, an immersion suit, my swimming suit, which I called Ursula after the James Bond lady. <laughs> they feature later. Of course, it's not just about the logistics, it's about some fairly brutal training as well. So everybody knows about pulling tires, but because you're going into an environment where you're not just pulling the sledge, but you're pushing it, you're lifting it, uh, you, you have to develop your power, you have to uh, develop strength, you have to develop endurance. Um, so you also have to inure yourself to all the weather conditions, you have to inure yourself to a degree to cold, pain and sleep deprivation. Also a few specialist training areas like swimming, So you have to think about the worst possible scenarios when you're preparing for an expedition like this. So I did a lot of water training, not just here in Norway, in an ice pond, but also actually in Colchester Diving Centre pool. I'd go in fully clothed with my skis on and uh, my coach, would make me take off my skis in the water and practice trying to get out of the water from the side of the pool while he would push me back down again with his feet. People passing by would say that ain't no way to treat your wife. <laughs> and this was our way of trying to simulate getting out of, of uh, the water if you fell through the ice. Also, uh, he was ex-army, so he had a good intro into the army in Colchester, and we got permission to go into the Colchester Military Correction Center. <coughs> in other words, the military jail. And we did some training with these people. And uh, if I can get the video to work, given my tech prowess, um, we can enjoy a little bit of this, and I apologize in advance about the noises. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> well, I'm glad I don't know how to do that nowadays, but anyway. <laughs> But the army were fantastic at training because they, they really uh, sounded out your weak points as well. And they also did um, a lot of sort of psychological training. They would put you under pressure and train you when you were tired, when you were sleep deprived. Uh, this picture here shows being blindfolded and uh, trying to sort of get you to awaken your other senses. But all this training that they did physically and uh, psychologically is very empowering because I found that when you were really, really pushed hard by them, you were forced already into a zone beyond your normal limits. And that in itself really bolstered one's uh, confidence um, and curiosity because you feel, yeah, great, fantastic. I can, I can go further than I thought I could go. So you're getting really well prepared for the challenge up ahead. And also, uh, very important, we're doing a lot of the physiological uh, research, gathering the material from the um, physical to the psychological. And here we have uh, Dr. Charlie Pedler, who some of you might know, sports scientist and researcher, looking slightly less than impressed at my performance. <laughs> um, but it was very important we gathered all this data before the expedition, as well as that that I uh, monitored during an expedition and afterwards as well, when um, experts like Tracy Davenport would produce a, um, a document which hopefully would get published as a scientific paper, which hopefully would be a benefit to other people, athletes, expeditions, etc. So the tougher the training and the more you prepare for it, the more your confidence grows at the same time. And ultimately in the last few weeks before departure, you bring everything down a little bit, uh, uh, lighten the training a bit, uh, put on some, some weight, You've got to put on the fat for a polar expedition because it represents larder, leverage, and an extra layer of warmth. So about literally 10 to 15 kilos. And then by departure, and this is on the eve of departure, you should be feeling like superwoman. And actually, I was feeling fit, yeah, but frightened and a bit fat. <laughs> and I love this uh, shot in particular by my expedition photographer, Martin Hartley, because it really captures an intense moment because for all those assiduous preparations and the nights preceding any of my expeditions, I always feel an icy finger of fear clawing at me in the small hours. And yet, I'm not actually frightened about what I know lies ahead. The stuff that I've been doing all that training for, the stuff that I've planned for. I'm not frightened of the physical challenge. I'm not actually even frightened of the perils that might lie ahead. What keeps me awake at night is actually the unknown that lies ahead of making a fool of myself or failure. But courage is going on despite the fear. You've got a lot of people at your back who you owe your loyalty to. So you set off. I was dropped 
by a little twin otter onto the ice. The twin otter took off a little tip of the wings as it went away and I was left utterly alone. Temperatures minus 40s. You know, as that plane took off, I felt a relief that it was taking off. I was alone. I felt a surge of elation. My sledge did feel heavy because, not physically, but it, it kind of, I was pulling behind me the responsibility of succeeding in what lay ahead because I had all the weight of the, the sponsors, the supporters, my family, my friends, everybody. But I was excited about what they had, at least for the first five minutes, and you get really cold and want to go home. <laughs> there's a wonderful quote that goes, there's no harm in hoping for the best as long as you're prepared for the worst. And I felt that I was as prepared as I could be for the worst. So let's take a look at the sort of stuff that lay ahead. Um, I know there's no scale to that, but um, those uh, moving lumps of ice were probably about sort of 25 to 30 feet high. And uh, I filmed that on actually the first expedition. And uh, I, what I didn't know that lay ahead was how different the Arctic was going to be to that the next time I went back. I mean, the first time I went was in 1997 and climate change um, and the environment just wasn't part of my or anybody's vocabulary in particular then. So environmental issues, for instance, weren't forefront of anyone's mind and they weren't still of mine when I set off on my solo expedition in 2007. However, it didn't take long before the changes smacked me in the face. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Despite the expression global climate warming, the temperatures initially were much colder than normal. Those temperatures of minus 40 started dropping in my first week to minus 50s. Now, I was saying earlier to someone today, you must not let those sort of temperatures intimidate you, but they're pretty frightening. And it sighs away physically and mentally, it strips away all your outer layers of protection. You know, that sort of social suit of armor you build up. So you better like what is underneath. Life quickly distills down to mere survival by every single action that you take in those temperatures. But your body is not designed to cope with these temperatures. Your exposed flesh freezes within minutes. Your skin around your fingers splits. Nails fall off. So does weight fall off at a frightening speed. And mentally, just when you need to be, um, can I have the rest of that for a minute? Mentally, just when you need to be razor sharp, uh, you slow down because your neural system is sending all the blood away from your brain to your extremities to keep them warm. 
away from your extremities, away from to your organs. So, how do you cope? Will you protect yourself from both the outside and the in? Outside, clothing. Some examples of which I've got here, because it takes 15 minutes to get dressed with all the layering that you have to put on. Inside, fuel. Five and a half thousand calories per day. Though actually, you probably need more than that. So you're on constant <coughs> calorie overdraft. Kit ceases to function. And strange things happen, like my tent shrunk and contracted. So I had to file down the tent poles, a real cold finger job to get the tent erected. The humble stove is vital in an expedition and that can pack up in these temperatures as well. The fuel will freeze in the pipeline and health and safety would have a heart attack because I used to keep a stub of a candle in a, a pocket as an emergency to light and warm up underneath the fuel pipe because you're in a race against time. At the end of the day, when you're really, really cold, really, really tired, and you need to get that stove lit because you need the warmth in your tent, you need to melt your ice to get your water, you need to have the water to make your hot meal, to dry your wet clothes out, but you're losing feeling in your fingers. So when you can no longer hold a match, you can hold a candle. So I used to hold my candle and wave it underneath the fuel pipe to get the stove working. It always used to make me think about that Mission Impossible opening line with the, the, the match and the light running out of time. Day three of my expedition, the temperatures which had by then sunk, as I said, to minus 50, actually sank, as I discovered later, to an unprecedented minus 60. It's very difficult to be able to cope with those sort of temperatures and no amount of kit equipment can sufficiently really protect you. And I got frostbite in my feet. And in one of my feet, I got uh, gangrene. So I had a choice which was either to call for an evacuation or to deal with the situation myself, which was to remove the gangrenous toes, which I did by sterilizing my Leatherman in my stove and removing the offending little piglets. I mean, when you've got frostbite, you don't actually you don't actually feel any pain because your, your flesh is dead, but it's when you remove the gangrenous flesh that it becomes painful. And the conditions certainly didn't help me after this. Pressure ridges, much worse than before, 50 feet and higher, row after row stretching into infinity. Crossing knees with such a painful foot became an interesting ordeal in dealing with pain. I found that um, I didn't cry at all. I don't know why not, whether it's because there was no one there to see or hear you crying, but sometimes I used to howl like an animal. And I found that really helped. Also, I had to concentrate on getting over these huge, great balls of ice. So I would treat every wall as a challenge in itself, each one. And each time I got to the top of one of these, 
I would regard that as a triumph. And I'd urge myself on. And sometimes this voice would come from inside me that I barely recognized as being my own. It was very authoritative, bossy, I would say, urging me on, encouraging me. And I came to know it as the field marshal. So it was quite a noisy business getting over these pressure ridges. But also, with the impact of climate changes, there was an awful lot more water to contend with. And in the past, in my first expedition, I always had a team or a teammate to help. You would take a risk like this, but you were literally putting your life into their hands and jumping for it. But now I was on my own. I had no teammates. So every risk I took had to be very carefully calculated. And if I wasn't leaping over a gully, then I'd have to make a swim for it in Ursula, who's over there. It's not as bad as it looks. In fact, I quite look forward to these little aquatics because the water was much warmer than it was outside. It was probably about minus two, minus three in the water. Whereas outside, it was in the minus 50s or whatever. However, every time I got into the water, it was a risk that I did still have to calculate. First of all, to look over to the far side and to check that there was a bank that I'd be able to get up onto at the other side. Also, to have a look around and make sure that there were no polar bears in the vicinity. Because dressed up in a suit, you actually looked, and in the water, you looked quite like a seal. So you make sure also that your sledge was evenly packed, the payload was even, otherwise you're basically going to get into the water with an anchor or the equivalent of. When I used to weigh up all these uh, risks, I used to refer to what I called the Shackleton rule, i.e. survival is paramount above success. The problem was there was an increasing amount of water to cross. And that was because of the increasing number of ferocious storms. Another symptom of climate change. These storms were really smashing up the ice until there was literally more water than there was ice to move over. And the ice flows became smaller. You became far more vulnerable to being shunted on these smaller, thinner slabs of ice by the currents below and the wind above. So you were, you were drifting with the currents or with the wind. And quite often uh, you were falling victim to what I'd call um, negative drift, when maybe you'd be tent bound in the storm and you could feel the ice shunting beneath you. And you knew that you were being dragged and sucked backwards away from the pole losing all those hard earned miles. So you had to keep psychologically really strong and positive about it. The storms wreaked such havoc that anyone else who might have been on the ice, there were two other expeditions uh, evacuated. And I found that I was the only person left on the entire Arctic Ocean on five and a half million square miles of ice. I was thrilled. <laughs> People seem to be fascinated and in awe and slightly horror struck by the idea of 
two things on this expedition or any polar expedition. It's the cold and the isolation that intrigues people. I do, in a sense, I loved it. I mean, I love the isolation because it intensified the whole experience. And people say, well, weren't you ever lonely? And um, no, I was totally alone, but I was uh, never lonely. And I suppose because one's very busy, but also I did have um, a sense of company. And I know that this is a trait that has been recorded in other expeditions like Shackleton has recorded it in his men, that you get a sense that there are other people there. There's, there's members of a team. Uh, so much so that quite often I look over my shoulder to check on my teammate behind. I would, I would actually mind my manners as well. Um, and I didn't want to, I felt as if I didn't want to offend somebody. I don't know who, it wasn't the field marshal. And I think it was fine and healthy and good that I could talk out loud, laugh out loud, sing out loud, curse. And of course I did have the field marshal as company. But also I found that isolation is a conduit to opening up other channels. It sharpens up your intuition and it equips you with, um, I don't know, awakens another sense uh, that seems to lie dormant when we're over here so that you can anticipate things. You can anticipate danger. <laughs> I found it a, a really useful uh, tool to have in my toolbox and it's almost like um, the more you strip away as I said earlier the more you gain in in that respect and in fact in the end really I sort of gave up on any tech gadgetry and relied for the most part on um, my antennae and my intuition however by about the 80th day of being in isolation on the ice, my senses, all of them, had dulled. And I made a mistake that nearly cost my life. And I remember this because it wasn't, it wasn't really the Arctic's fault in a way, it was my fault. And if I have time to quickly share the story, I was by then, sleep deprived because I'd been uh, sleeping or snatching maybe one and a half, two hours sleep every 24 hours because of the negative drift and my fight against making mileage. I was malnourished uh, and exhausted, but also probably slightly stoned <laughs> from the painkillers for my foot. Because I'd been losing valuable mileage to negative drift. I was being dragged away from the pole at the rate of, I, I think I was losing two in every three miles. I was hungry for mileage and I was running out of time. Spring thaw was at my heels with ice melting beneath me. I came across an area of what had recently been open water and it had a very thin crust of ice over it. Obviously it had just started freezing over in the last few hours. It was black ice which needs new ice but also um, I knew from experience that if that ice wasn't broken anywhere, whilst it might bend underneath my weight, because of its viscosity it might hold me and my sledge. I used to call it rubber ice, that kind of ice. However, I know, I can see it now when I look back in my mind, I could see a little telltale black 
light snaking its way across the center of this frozen area. And instead of making a detour or putting Ursula on, I merely lengthened the rope to my sledge, put on my skis, and wearily set forth across this ice. The ice bent beneath me, but as I approached the center, it began to creak and groan. And then there was this fearful splintering sound and the ice clapped beneath me. I began to sink in stately fashion. And this was where all the training and all that tedious drilling kicked in. So without even thinking about it, threw the arms out akimbo. As I went down, I was looking all around to see where my nearest escape route might be. Eventually, I sunk all the way down to my armpits. Right, skis off, just as we drilled in that pool back in Colchester. It took a bit of nerve to actually take the gloves off, throw them off the mitts, get your skis off, lift them out. And I can remember throwing them out of this hole that I was in because I could, I could hear them clattering as they, they skidded across the ice. Then, of course, I had to try to get out, but every time I pressed on the ice to get out, the ice would just break. So the hole was getting deeper, bigger. I was taking more water on into my clothing, which was getting heavier, I was getting colder, and I was getting tireder. Suddenly this, this thought came into my head. I, I remembered seeing a seal, seal earlier on in the expedition with its head bobbing up out of the water. And I thought, well, I'm, I must look a bit like that seal right now. Golly, I must be hypothermic if I'm thinking like this. And, um, <coughs> and I thought, no, hang on a second. Does a seal get out of the water? It doesn't press down in the sun. It just throws itself out and spreads its weight. And so I looked up across the ice and I thought, right, it goes. And as I did that, I could see my skis and I could see the illustrations that my then very young son had painted on those skis of butterflies and rainbows and caterpillars. And I thought, I've got to get out of here because I've got to get back. So with tremendous power, I know not where it came from, I jettisoned myself out of that hole, chest first. And I got out and I wiggled furiously across the ice to the other side. Of course, the danger isn't over by that point because um, you've left your hole behind. That's not it, because I didn't have the wherewithal to take the picture of it, but it gives you an idea. And uh, you're going to turn into a frozen lollipop within minutes if you don't do something about it. And so I prepared for this before in my training of thinking of worst case scenarios. So it was off with the outer mitts and off quickly with boots, which were freezing around one. Put on dry set of socks and inner gloves, which I've kept in spare bags in my flying suit. Put 
empty ration bags over those dry layers in my boots and then put the wet boots back on and the outer gloves back on and move like a mad thing, pulling the sledge behind you. And I skied for the rest of that day with my sledge nonstop until the late evening hours, only stopping for water and chocolate. And at the end of that day, in the tent, um, was I shaken up by that experience? I, th I think actually I, it just bolstered my resolve, actually. I thought I got through that one and tomorrow's another day and I will continue afresh and said a little prayer of thanks. At the end of the day, you think, well, you wouldn't have chanced your life like that on these sorts of expeditions. Is it all worth it? Look at the price tag you pay, but look at the dividends. So I say, yes. Every one of my expeditions, whether over ice or sand, has been a voyage of discovery, physically, psychologically, and spiritually, too. They are undeniably proof to me that we all have so much more power and potential than we realize or recognize most of the time. Unless we put ourselves right out there. And that it doesn't matter what gender, size, shape, whether we have a beard or not. It's, it's all about what's in your head and what's in your heart. And it's not about conquering nature, but it's about conquering all your fears. So I'd like to say thank you very much for listening to me and that any dream, no matter how ambitious it might be, is not beyond any of us. And I'd like to, on that note, wish Team Force Atlantic all the best in pursuing their own dreams and goals. And I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. So, who we are. So it's really important to understand what our main aim is. And, and anyone that's not seen the World Toughest Row, it's 3,000 nautical miles across the Atlantic. Um, and it takes one person to have a dream to do that and then to formulate that plan and get everybody else on board. And the who, uh, who's on board with our team is up on this slide here. And that's just the pictures of some of the team. And we've got four rowers, two reserve rowers and six support team. And we actually class it all as one force because without a single element of them people, we wouldn't be able to succeed. And we certainly wouldn't have got to where we've got to already. So we are all, all together uh, and every single person's got a role that's just as important. And the rowers as well, they've also got a secondary role so they don't get away with it in just doing the fizz side. Uh, myself, I'm part of the logistics, so I have to get us from A to B and hopefully get that boat from A to B, but we'll see if that, that materialises later on. And some of the people we've got up on the screen then, uh, some of our support team are up there. It's a big theme with dogs that you'll notice. Pretty much everybody up on the slide owns a dog. Uh, we try not to take them to a bed, but that definitely, definitely describes the sort of people that we are and formulates us as a team because everyone's got mutual things going on in the background uh, that has become pretty much everyone's family. And I'm sure we'll get them dogs in there somewhere later down the line as well. Um, everyone's from different backgrounds and that's what's key. Uh, our team, not one of us are alike in our background apart from that we're all military. Um, and that's been scoped from different ranks across the military and reservists and in the regular space. 
Um, and that was part of our skipper's main aim, Imi. She wanted to make sure that everybody across the military uh, in the women's space was given an opportunity. And then when we first started off the selection process, she deliberately didn't look at the ranks of people. And that was blacked out. So somebody else took all them applications in and they blacked out the ranks so that Imi had no concept of, and the rest of the support team had no concept of who that person was apart from what they put down in that paperwork and took that out of it. Um, but it's really interesting to give opportunities from right from private all the way to major. And going through the process, we've managed to keep a really broad selection of ranks of people going through. So from our lowest ranks right up to our highest ranks is involved in the process. And I think that's quite nice. Um, but yeah, we've got some, some really key things that we've carried through that are very similar as well. So the military background and what we want to achieve by the end of it. And that really sets us up as a team. So the people, the journey and the legacy, three really big key points to us and key elements. Um, and this has been one of our main aspects to make sure that we follow this through. Um, and we keep talking about this as we go through. To me personally, uh, the people are the people that have gone before us, the people that will meet along the route and the people that we need in order to help us to get to where we're going to. Uh, the journey, well, it's gonna be very emotional. Uh, and it started quite a while back now. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more on that in a minute. And the legacy is the key part. It's what, what we do after the work. So anyone can get on a rowboat and they could naturally drift from one side to the other. It's going to take a, a long period of time, don't get me wrong. But you've got to think about us as a team are going to go and do it. What do we want to achieve in doing that with the people that can go after us? So we need to be able to achieve it to a set standard that we're happy with as a team, but then that, that allows other people that didn't think that it was possible to take the information that we've gained, the knowledge that we've gained, um, and take that and then go and accomplish something themselves. And that not, might not be to go and row in the future, but our legacy might just be able to take people out of their own comfort zone and go and do something else, their own barrier, their own hurdle, their own accomplishment. And hopefully we'll be able to supply the tools or at least a guide in order to help people. So our legacy is really key. Um, and I think when we all get together, we always go back to that legacy piece, don't we, and see it as our golden thread that is gonna follow us all the way through um, this adventure and journey that we're on. So the people then are ambassadors, advisors, and uh, patrons. Uh, so when Amy originally had this idea that, uh, she wanted to row across the Atlantic. She'd done this very early on in her military career. So for her, it was key that she had these people to look up to and to reach out to that were there as her supporting network. That then when we've now established this team, we all get the same benefits from that as well. And the weird thing is, Emmy actually came up with this idea while having uh, fajitas just sat in the mess. So it's quite a um, strange thing where her mind wandered off to there. But she instantly contacted uh, Captain Pollock and he's part of this team down here on the right hand side. Uh, and this is the military team that has been before and you'll notice that it's two females, two males and then you'll see the all male team. And that's what makes us different. We will be the first all female military team to go across the Atlantic. And that was something that we wanted um, as a team but something that we really think that we can expand on and use as a knowledge setting for people in the future to know that it, you know, it doesn't matter. Gender can sometimes be a boundary, it can be a barrier, and we really want to you know, push through that and open up that space. But the teams that have been before were key in that initial phase and really key now because they've done it. The more knowledge that you can absorb from others is only going to enhance your own experience or at least give you a little bit of an insight to what you're setting yourself up for. So there are some other people. We've also um, got some, some higher authority across the military, which you'll see in there. Um, and the Army Adventurers Training Group, and, and Emma will talk about this a little bit later on, but the, the AT group that works with the military and allows us to go and do different adventure training activities, they're gonna independently set up a different space of women that have done experts that can then feed that information back in and basically give a one-stop shop 
of knowledge so that everybody else that then wants to come and try something can. Because that's something we're not very good at. We're not good at sharing practices, the things that went wrong, the things that went right. How do you get to that first part of initially setting up your expect or setting up your first goal or your ambition? How do you first get to it? So we're hoping that we can lead into these. They've given loads of information and they can share this knowledge army-wide to make sure any soldier that then goes forward can go, actually, someone's been there, done it before me. All I need to do is go and download this document and it'll give me a how-to guide. Perfect. Because there's loads of people that have done it, they just haven't given me a how-to guide. So that's our main aim, getting that back out there as well. Um, Army Service Women's Network. So uh, again, in the Army, uh, women are still a minority like they are in most working organisations and spaces. And this network is set up to make sure that we can answer questions and be there for the younger generations that are coming through. But we've got someone to lean on left and right. And again, they're really supporting this campaign uh, and supporting us through the process. Uh, and then up in the top right corner, you'll see that's the initial team sat there. Um, and most of them are joining us online today. And these are the, I always say, these are the brains behind it originally. These had all the crazy ideas that they reached out there to the rest of the army via a poster uh, and a QR code to get us all on board. And now as you look up, you'll see that actually Image the Heaters have now made a guest experience, uh, appearance and we've actually got the whole pan there. Um, and this is that first planning stage. And as you can see, she's just jotted down a thought process and then she's reached out to people to enable her to allow that thought process to grow. She put in a bid for the boat, won the bid for the boat, and then you've got to then think, how are you going to get other people on board? And they've done this with the advertisement that you can see in the middle there. Uh, have you got what it takes? Four Atlantic back, four women, four soldiers, one ocean. And that was the initial outlook. So there's only four people that can be in that boat, that's all it will fit in. Um, but actually, that's not where our team ends. The 12 people is where our team is, and it's, it's inclusive of that. Uh, and it wouldn't be what it is without them. So when that first went out, it got pushed out on social media, um, 110 applicants come forward. Now 110 women from across the army put themselves out there and thought, this looks like a good idea. Okay, so they all jumped on board and they went down to their first selection and that selfie that's being taken down the bottom there, that's some of the, the people. And it was opened up pretty much like um, a hybrid a, a time to be able to still put yourself forward, bearing in mind our career. So some of us would have been out of country, um, some of us wouldn't have been able to attend in person at that time. So what the team did is they adapted their process to make sure that everybody had a fair chance at being able to be part of this. Um, and some people were able to do it online, virtually, sending in applications, sending in assessments. Uh, and it looked at quite a few different elements of the person. So it looked at their physical aspect, uh, how they worked with teams. They did some command tasks, which is just like a little activity where they'll nominate someone to be in charge or they'll not nominate and they'll just see how you figure it out amongst yourselves. So that series of tasks went on um, and they managed to get the numbers down to 56 people being offered a place on the next phase. Um, and then you see all these happy faces down here in this bottom corner. Uh, this is post activity, so we can smile at this point. But we jumped in the Menai of part of this election. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the Menai, but it gets a little bit choppy, a little bit of rapid. Um, and the team had thought for a good part of the selection, what they wanted to do is put this kit on and just step off the ledge under the bridge, which sounds pretty good till you stood on that ledge. And then the film crew are also there watching us. The rest of the people that are on the selection are also there. And we have to put ourselves through them sort of stresses while they just watched on. So they've got to figure out who's in, right? So that was, that was a good test. Um, during that phase as well, we went up the mountains, didn't we? Some pretty harsh weather conditions. Yeah. Um, and when I say harsh weather conditions, people were actually near enough rolling down mountains uh, within safety. Uh, but we were getting a side swipe with the weather, the rain was coming in, wind was good, um, and it really tested us. But what else did it allow us that first bonding moment? Allowed you to be outside of your normal comfort zone and see how you work together. Um, and then moments we shared in tents, we shared a hot chocolate in a tent, which was interesting. 
Um, so we ended up in the same tent when we battered up that night, um, shared a hot chocolate and then straight to bed, ready for your next activity, hoping that you're going to be part of this team. So there's always that added stress and pressure as well. You know, you've got to be on your A game, but you've got to be true to yourself. But there's no point in giving the team somebody who's not true to themselves because they won't be able to be true to the team later on in the day. Due to the life for a short period of time, you can't maintain that for a two year process. And you're certainly not going to be able to hide it once you get a little tiny boat and all four of us is crammed in together. So it was really good, really good to be tested. Uh, and then you'll see the boat itself up in the top there. Um, and to explain it in short terms, and really two tiny little cabins, that's where you can get your two hours rest in after you've rowed for two hours. That will be continuous the whole time you're on the ocean. Hopefully anywhere from 32 days to six weeks. 32 days sounds around about the record at the moment, but um, two hours on, two hours off. Two people sat in that little bit, rowing the heart out, um, and the other two people, hopefully not. But if the weather changes, it could be three up. Um, and that goes down to the, the skipper at the time deciding how she wants to go forward with that and the team all working together to make sure it happens. Um, but quite a confined space. So that's why the selection process was one of the key things um, to making sure that we get that right. Some of the other stuff then to make sure that we get it right, you can see there, you can see down our route. Uh, there's the 3,000 nautical miles, that's all. Well and good being 3,000 miles, but it changes with the weather, right? So you could go a little bit off drift, back in. Um, there's the start line with all the boats lined up, and we've got some tests that we've done along the route to get us to where we're at as well. So we're currently, we've got a dietitian, we've got um, who deals with all our nutritional base. Uh, we do strength and conditioning for a strength and conditioning coach. Um, we've done some testing down at St. Mary's as well. So we've been testing our VO2 maxes uh, and checking our body compositions. So we've had quite a lot going on there. Um, and then obviously looking at the rower itself, which we simulate at the moment using a Concept 2 rower. And the pain that I feel on a Concept 2 rower, I'm hoping it's not too much like the boat, but I'll let you know once we get our hands on the boat uh, and hopefully I'll be able to come back and talk about the reality of that at some point. But hopefully not as that painful. Uh, there's Emmy, she's a little skipper, she's up there. Um, and basically this was to do with the new band branding. And what they wanted to do is they first looked at the branding and it didn't represent us. Now if you see these, these blouses that we're wearing, shirts that we're wearing, this branding is our new branding that they designed. The old branding's just up there. You see it's a nice black and blue square and that's as exciting as it's got. However, we like to think that we bring a little bit more personality to it than that. And we like to represent us. And our new branding is actually the ocean for female rowers that you can see sat on the boat and our new name, Force Atlantic 24. Um, so a lot's gone on behind the scenes already to get us to where we're at. Uh, and we'll continue to keep working on this. Uh, money's been quite important to us. A lot of our, what we're going to do is through um, how we raise money for the charity that we raised me for, but also we need funding to get us off the start line as well. Um, and that's the space that we're in at the moment. We're in looking for our sponsorship. We're making sure that we can get off to a good start when we start. Um, and then social media as well. So we have to make sure we've got social media right. So anyone that's not following us on social media, please do find us after this, give us a follow. Um, and then you can watch us all the way through, hopefully to the end and even watch the live race in December 24th. So it gives a link on there, but instantly by changing the branding, um, social media went up. So more people were viewing it instantly just because of the branding being more attractive, drawing you in, a little bit more exciting than the standard army branding. Hopefully the army's not watching this right now. Um, how we've done it and what we've done along the route up to now. So this is uh, a schematic basically of how we originally started planning it out and doing training camps. Now, most of our selection process has eaten up a lot of our time in order because we found that that was about getting it right. And if you get things right from the start, you've got the right people on board, everybody can take on different roles. We know that that's then going to create success that's going to follow through. Um, so we spent a lot of time with these social events, so these business going out to the pub. Um, these sort of social events are just where we're testing ourselves in different environments as well. So we've done a bit of ice skating, uh, but it's dancing on ice. Uh, again, just because that's not normal for us. 
So it's a different atmosphere. A couple of bambies going around, a couple of the ones that you hear hold the side, because you kind of make your way around. Um, and then there was some people who really enjoyed it and they were doing spins, going through his legs. And, yeah, great atmosphere. Uh, another social one that we've done is we built a raft. So we've got two teams. We built two different rafts out of barrels, logs, tied them together, got very competitive all of a sudden. Won't mention any names, but one team happened to run forward, steal the oars off the other one's boat, took them in the water already, but hey, it definitely wasn't on my team. Um, but it was good just to create that atmosphere. And it's good to make sure that we can work together while taking the military side out of it, because when we're on that boat, it's just us. So we do like these social events. Um, and some of the other things we've got coming forward then is we've got a dinner night, a charity yeah. event, a launch event, and then the, the, the main event, which is Rovi Atlantic. And then we're going to have this whole other piece that comes after to make sure our legacy continues and loads of other people can get into this space and get on board. Some of the courses that we've got to do then uh, in the technical training, we've also got to do 120 20 hours rowing before we're allowed to get on board the boat and, and set off the start line. The problem at the moment being our boat's not ready for you. She's currently on the Pacific, so our boat's called Rosie. She's currently making her way across the Pacific. Once she does that, she'll come back to us. We'll get her later on in the year, around about December, and then we'll start getting our hours in on the water. So probably we're just concept two rowers. Okay, so hopefully it'll go to plan the other way. Uh, but there's other, there's other courses we need to do, which are safety courses. So for an example of this, we've got to be able to do first aid at We've got to do a bit of sea survival. We've got to do a little bit of comp crew. Um, and that should be the name of two of them. So we're going down in October for two weeks. We'll base ourselves down at Gosport and we'll carry out them safety courses, all as a collective. Uh, and from this, working as a collective as well, we'll be able to see what is going to weakness for. So we know exactly what to use when we're out on the, on the water. Um, so that would be really good as well. Uh, and then we've got some more training camps. And every time we get together on a training camp, we go and do a little bit of a test to see where our physical standards are then at, um, so that they know exactly how to reprogram us. So all of that is individual based. So when we go down there, we get tested. Our coaches then take that information away. And then they might say, for example, um, that I need to improve on my cardio base, but my strength might be okay at that point, or I might need to strengthen up a certain part. So for example, for those that you've got kids in the room, it's quite a few. I always carry the wee man on one side. So I had really strong abs on one side, but really weak on the other. So straight away, the coach could identify this and then change my training program. So now that I, I don't walk around one key anymore, um, and I'm starting to straighten that up. But they've done that for every single person. Um, so that's been good and really useful. So that's some of the events that we've got going on. That will take us all the way up to December 24. Uh, we'll also have to ship Rosie out. So we'll end up with a period of time where we've got Rosie and then we'll ship her off and she'll meet us at the start line and then we'll fly on out and then uh, get going. So we're going to All right. I'll, I'll... I'll stop talking. <laughs> I, know, I know exactly what you mean. Well, I'm actually going to hand over to Emma who talk a lot faster than me. I just like a chat. <laughs> so um, our charity, the Girls Network, before I got involved with this campaign, I didn't even know about this charity. They're quite a small charity, and I don't know if anyone's heard of them before, but one of um, our um, colleagues, she uh, came across a charity. She um, volunteers for them currently, and their values very much align with what we want as well as our campaign. Um, it's all about inspiring that young generation of, of women. Um, so what the charity does is they connect with schools across the country, mostly based down south, and they provide uh, mentors to young girls who would like them. And so basically it's anything that they would like, really. So I know Emily said that one of her girls um, needed support with CV stuff for um, applying to their universities and things. So it's whatever that individual would like support with and that mentor We'll provide that to them um so yeah so it's quite although it's quite a small charity i think they are building um so the aim is to raise funds for them so they can connect with more schools across the country and hopefully just to spread the word really so please follow them i know if you don't get the qr code the girls network they are on social media they've got a new um brand now so it's changed so if you see it it's i think it's slightly different um but yeah so this is this is the aim isn't it inspiring that next generation um, so yeah, I think that's it with the girls' network. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So just, I know you want me to be quiet. I'm just gonna, two seconds of time, I promise. Um, 
So engagement, we'll be doing quite a lot of engagement post this, but also during, uh, pretty much like today, we will get out and engage with some people. We are doing a documentary, so we'll be released post once we've finished everything. Um, and we're working towards the service of the no trading, previously mentioned a bit. But if you want to know more information, you have to follow us on social media because I'm not talking more. Um, but that is